This is the story of how home computers came to be. Before 1970, there were no home computers. This would be like having your own train. It just didn't make sense. They were huge and expensive. Even leasing time on one was expensive. By 1968, some computers were getting smaller, but they still cost more than a house back then. CRT and their controllers were also expensive, some costing as much as the computer itself. But CRT terminals started to become essential to keep up with newer data speed, since they were faster than line printers and it didn't make noise or need any ink. So here we begin this story with what became to be known as programmable terminals. The data point 2200 was built by a couple ex-NASA engineers down in San Antonio. It had a sleep case and everything was self-contained. Data point suggested an instruction set for Intel to try and build into a single chip processor. At the time, Intel didn't put much urgency on the project and dragged their feet on getting it done, but that instruction set did eventually become the 8008 microprocessor. DataPoint's first customer was Pillsbury Farms, who put these compact computers at each of their poultry divisions for payroll and inventory using their own custom programming. Meanwhile, another fella over in Los Angeles sold this box called the Kenback One. With nine memory map registers and a full instruction set, it was a complete programmable system. He sold a few, but it really was only meant for learning the principles of computing. Intel did eventually make that microprocessor idea using the instruction set proposed by DataPoint. To teach people how to use the new chip, they sold a development kit that also included software such as an assembler and Fortran compiler. The Odyssey here doesn't look like much, but it used this interface to connect to existing televisions. This was one step into people's homes with an inexpensive electronic gizmo you could buy at stores. In the heyday of the Apollo program, HP made a series of advanced programmable calculators. They were still very expensive and only had a one row screen. But this one could do basic and had ROM cartridges to add more features. Here's an example of how the programming on these HPs evolved, where basic made things much easier. After selling some patents to IBM a decade earlier, Dr. An Wong started his own computer company in Massachusetts. He designed and built a desktop sized personal computer. No, it wasn't liquid cooled. That big box is an external CPU that was expensive to make, and for a while it was faster than those new microprocessors. Wang systems were programmable, but generally used for excellent word processing software. A company over in Toronto made this portable device called the Microcomputer Machine. This device was programmed using APL and used Intel's new 8008 processor. The MCM only had a single row screen, but the tape drive could be used for extra virtual storage memory. It sold for a few years, but it cost more than a car. After working on a prototype for a while, in 1975, IBM also tested the market of a small computer with the IBM 5100. This was still an expensive system, but it had a lot of functionality since it was able to run some existing mainframe software. The built-in screen was small, but the system allowed several external monitors to be daisy-chained to an output jack on the back. This was useful for scientific labs, where an experiment might be hazardous, but they could relay status onto monitors in another room. The 5100 is also part of a time travel story that became popular anime series back in the year 2011. The Altair is sort of a complete opposite to the IBM 5100 since it is a budget kit with no software and the input is by flip switches. There were two other famous kits before the Altair. One was the TV typewriter in 1973 and the other was the Mark 8 in 1974. These two kits inspired many hobbyists with the idea of making their own computer with the Altair being an affordable starting point. A year later, the Soul 20 was introduced. This used the same S100 bus and Intel 8080 processor as the Altair kit, but began to look more like a practical machine for use at home. Still, the parts were expensive since there weren't many places to get them from. More software was becoming available for these early microcomputers, such as CPM operating system and a word processor called Electric Pencil. Besides disk drive controllers, 
other available expansion options were audio synthesizers and modems. To get the cost down further, engineers focused on reducing the number of chips involved. Many kits were about six boards, but these were arranged down to a single piece that became generally known as the motherboard. This helped to streamline the process by making these computers, much like the Ford Model T, concepts for mass production. As these old ads from Byte Magazine show, there were many startups trying to figure out how to market this new idea of an appliance computer. The race was on to secure chips and components and to build up product support, which included warranties and comprehensive manuals. Emulators on mainframes were used to help build the initial wave of software for these microcomputers. But mainframe connections were expensive to lease and became unreliable as the number of users increased. So these small systems were welcome competition to help drive down the equipment cost and put an end to the days of leased computers. The three manufacturers that ended up becoming the most successful were Commodore Apple and Tandy. These were later called the trinity of microcomputers that started the industry of consumer home computers. These microcomputers were sold through a growing chain of dedicated computer stores opening in every state. The prices shown here are for base models that only had 4K of memory and a cassette tape for data storage. While a text terminal mode has become a standard feature, the Apple II also had a high-res graphic mode and its basic had extended keywords, making it easier to write games. Tandy had its own unique advantage of being able to sell through their many existing Radio Shack stores. This helped the TRS-80 become the first system to reach 100,000 units sold before 1980. The Italian physicist Federico Fagin, who had developed the Intel 8080 processor, also developed a lower cost version called the Zilog 80. Gary Kittall, creator of the CPM operating system, largely favored the Z80 and 8086 processors. Notice that many of these systems connected to a regular television set using an adapter similar to what Odyssey had used. Chuck Peddle, an ex-Marine and engineering physics major from Maine, introduced the 6502 microprocessor as a cheaper alternative to the Motorola 6800. One of the earliest programs for these systems was Micro Chess that could be played against the computer. Early third-party software was informally sold in small bags, either by mail or at computer fairs. But soon, software appeared in stores, being sold as media with box art similar to books or movies. In 1979, the first killer app was introduced called VisiCalc. While most folks were familiar with word processing already, VisiCalc was something new entirely and made formulas and numerical analysts far easier for non-programmers. As groundbreaking as VisiCalc was, software patents were not allowed until 1981. In 1980, Microsoft took advantage of a feature in the Apple expansion bus that let it dual process as a Z80 system. This helped to increase the popularity of Apple computers and made them more useful as a business tool for small offices. With all this new activity, IBM once again decided to examine the small computer market as they had done in 1975. The initial prototype was called Project Chess, while the end product was referred to as Acorn by the developing partners. In an unexpected departure to normal practices, this time IBM avoided using in-house parts and instead used off-the-shelf components. IBM also coordinated with many industry partners to gain third-party hardware and software support for their new system. With market conditions changing and IBM's apparent willingness to work with others, after 13 years the antitrust case against IBM was finally dropped shortly after the release of the IBM PC. Like most manufacturers of the time, the IBM manuals included extensive logic diagrams, hardware schematics, and technical details about the instruction set. But surprisingly, IBM also included a full disclosure of the BIOS ROM assembly code. This was like revealing the secret sauce that was the key to making the system work. The example shown here shows how the system decides to boot to a disk or after four retries, will start with the built-in basic. Such details quickly led to IBM PC clones being made. IBM did raise issue with those who made complete unaltered copies of their BIOS, but many manufacturers made their own custom BIOS while still remaining IBM PC compatible. IBM did initially intend to use the existing CPM operating system. 
it is a bit of a mystery on why this didn't happen, with a lot of speculation about it. As events turned out, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, had come across an alternative called 86DOS. This was developed by Tim Patterson, who was the same engineer involved in making the earlier Z80 soft card. IBM packaged this as PC-DOS, and a few years later, Microsoft released it as MS-DOS. One of the most successful IBM PC-compatible clones was the Tandy 1000. As we see here from this advertisement, consumers could now get full-featured home computers for far less than the average cost of a car. But there is an interesting backstory to these Tandy computers. In 1984, IBM began to market a less expensive system called the PC Junior. Despite several good innovations, the keyboard was awful, and severe cost-cutting design aspects made the machine overall noticeably slower than the original IBM PC. A year earlier, Tandy had a Model 2000 that also wasn't very successful due to several technical issues. Tandy learned from those mistakes, and the subsequent Tandy 1000 was said to be what the IBM PC Junior should have been. Beyond entertaining games, these IBM compatible systems introduced professional software such as AutoCAD and Flight Simulator. Now we come to the famous Apple Macintosh. Its 1984 Super Bowl commercial remains memorable to this day. Like the prior Lisa system, the Macintosh was striving for design excellence and had nailed it with the overall look and the graphical operating system. The Macintosh finally brought together concepts of a human and machine interfaces from over a decade earlier into an affordable desktop appliance. Come in, Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. All right, as it moves up or down or sideways, so does the tracking spot. And the, the principles for its operation are quite easy to see. Its principle is that there are two wheels that roll on the surface. But since they're at right angles and kind of sharp edges, one roll and the other slide in one direction. Each of, it, each of these wheels controls through a potentiometer with a voltage output sampled by an ADD converter. The numbers taken in by the computer at sample times as to what the horizontal vertical components are to be of where it should put the tracking spot. The main inspiration to the Macintosh was the Alto, which was a legendary system from 1973 that pioneered the idea of combining raster graphics and a mouse to make a graphical user interface. The Macintosh was a great achievement and did show the art of the possible in a microcomputer package, but Apple itself had other product offerings that were less expensive and more popular in terms of sales. This last chapter of the story is how microcomputers became not only personal, but also truly portable. Manufacturers began to shrink these computers even further, trying new ideas in industrial design and integrating with components that used less power, like LCDs, so that the entire system could run on batteries for many hours. The Model 100 was another successful Tandy product used by students, journalists, authors, and was very convenient for keeping notes and simple games while on the go. The Sharp PC5000 was itself far less successful since its 8-row screen was hard to read and its bubble memory tech ended up being overly expensive. These are just two examples to show how digital computers had now become common consumer products. And so, this is how home consumer market of computers came to be. According to a census report, only 8% of households had a computer in 1984. To encourage broader use, there were public service announcements broadcast on television. These were short, one-minute intermission commercials shown throughout the day to give ideas on what a home computer could be used for. One of those ideas was the use of online public communication services, such as CompuServe, Prodigy, and America Online. How we got here involved many corporate professionals and amateur hobbyists working to perfect these systems 
and help make them affordable. There were many forms of early personal computers, each advancing the state of the art in their own way. Home computers were just one byproduct from that earlier pioneering work. At the same time, many computers also continued to be enhanced, serving corporate data processing needs and starting to be used in the making of movies, such as Tron. Industrial computers were built to endure harsher environments and more efficiently operate heavy machinery. Embedded computers began to be used to monitor fuel ratios in our cars and help improve navigation in airplanes. Game consoles were also evolving during this journey as they pushed the envelope of interactive audio and visual experiences. Thank you for watching this story and taking some time to reflect upon the past.